So welcome. If you haven't been to a first Tuesday event, the format is the presenter will go and present for about 40, 45 minutes. We'll have some Q&A. And then we typically go out for networking. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight. We're starting something new called Five to Five. The last five minutes, we're going to have someone come up and talking about teaming opportunities. Due to these events, we find that people are obviously wanting to collaborate more. They're finding more connections. They're finding more opportunities to, that they can work together for projects or grants. So those are some, some, some of the things that he's going to talk about tonight for just five minutes. And then if people are interested, you can talk more in a networking session. So again, welcome to this month's first Tuesday event. We typically call this News Before Brews at Westgate. Tonight, I'm excited to have Bob Patty, who is president of Enhanced Semiconductors. Unless you have been sheltered the last few months, you are very much aware that something exciting is in the works here at Westgate. On November 21st, 2022, Governor Eric J. Holcomb and Secretary of Commerce Brad Chambers joined local officials and business executives right here at the Westgate Academy in Oden, Indiana. They broke ground on a new microelectronics campus, which if you haven't seen, there is a sign over here that says Westgate 1 in this cornfield area, so I think they're going to start drilling and starting to do some construction soon. This campus, according to Governor Fulcom, will be at the forefront of creating critical components to ensure both economic and national security. And guess who is poised to be the anchor of this campus? No other than enhanced semiconductors. We are pleased to have Bob Patty take time out of his busy schedule to drive here from Chicago to speak of his company, what they are performing in 2.5D and 3D integration of technology, and also to touch on the new enhanced collaborative boundary at Westgate. With no further ado, Bob Patty. Thank you. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk to you about uh, the industry, kind of how we got here, what advanced packaging is, and then some of what we do. And I invite any of you, if you have questions along the way, please raise your hand, let me know, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, we, I only have 28 slides, so we have plenty of time to get this in. I'm going to start with, how did you get here? So we're all very familiar with electronics, and, you know, semiconductors have been shrinking in size for 50 years. It's been fantastic. You know, every couple of years you can get a computer that runs faster, a phone that does more, and it costs less. But if you look over the last maybe 10 years, the dirty little secret is atoms don't scale. You can't get small. We're already building things that are literally one monatomic layer of material. So we're running out of the ability to scale. And it's becoming much, much more costly. The cost of building a new factory today at the leading edge is more than $30 billion. In the next generation, it will be between $50 and $70 billion. There's very few things that we can build enough of to cost justify doing that. NVIDIA, when they built the latest generation of AI chip, spent $2.2 billion Designing the chip, not building a factory for it, just to design the chip. So this is self-limiting. Unless we're all going to be happy with one cell phone, and we all get to use the same one, and one computer, and we all get to use the same kind of computer, we need a different path forward. And that path forward, I'm going to justify you to use tonight, is advanced packaging and additive silicon manufacturing. It changes the way the world works. We're going to see this sea change in how semiconductors are built and how the economics around electronics works for the next 10 to 20 years. I relate this to this period we're in as to what happened between steam locomotives and diesel locomotives. The people who built steam locomotives made them bigger, so they had better economies of scale. They built steam turbines, they built coal turbines. They made it much more sophisticated, much like what we're doing with semiconductors today. They cost more, the factories cost more, and then diesels came along and put those people out of business in five years. 
And the reason was that was cheaper to build and cheaper to maintain. It took 21 people every night to service that steam locomotive. It took three to service the diesel locomotive. The economics changed. And that sea change in that industry is much like what we're going to see in some the good news is I don't think it knows any longer than this or any of the other semiconductor manufacturers because, in fact, we need what they do as feed material to the new way we build chips. So it's going to be a different market with different people, like Enhanced, building a different way in what I call Foundry 2.0. So Foundry 2.0, or what I call a finishing pack. We take partially finished components and we put them together very tightly. And because we can assemble them very tightly, we can also put different kinds of materials together. And this is building, some of you may have heard of chiplets as the path forward. So instead of building a very large, single complicated processor, for instance, we're going to break that processor into maybe a dozen or two dozen chiplets. Intel's latest generation of AI device graphics processing unit has 47 chiplets in it. Every part that analog to uh, excuse me, uh, AMD makes today is chiplet based. Every processor they make is chiplet based. So this is already happening. This isn't just a good idea that Bob has that we hope someday will. It is happening in the marketplace today. The benefit is, if you base it on chiplets, if I want to change that design, I can just have a different combination of those chips. If I want to add some new feature, maybe I have to build one new chiplet. It fundamentally changes how we build things. Instead of spending $2.2 billion to build the next GPU, maybe I can build it for $20 million. I'm going to build one chiplet. I'm going to make a new semiconductor circuit card to fit those together. It radically changes the economics. And I'll point out this is an extreme benefit to our military. Because military day today has the problem they can't afford building $2.2 billion chips for the next jet plane. It takes too long, it costs too much. And if you're only building 100 of them, those chips get really, really expensive. Okay. So today is model, what I call boundary 1.0. And as I say, it's not going anywhere. It's driven by this high development cost. The high cost of capital, the 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 billion dollar package. It takes a long time to do these things with a lot of risk. You're building something that you're investing in maybe this run of the chip. It could be a hundred million dollars worth of engineering that goes to produce it. Maybe you want to long, you get to spend a hundred million dollars again. That uh, graphics AI chip that I talked about with the 47 chiplets, um, its companion part, the processor, is on its 50th mass test. 50 of them. And I guarantee you that those are tens of millions of dollars for each mass test. It's probably costing about a billion dollars in mass to a million dollars. It's way too expensive. And ultimately, it's limited. How can you innovate? How can you take risk if the cost of taking risk? is measured in tens or hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. Okay, so we're in the twilight of Moore's law. So the new model, Boundary 2.0. You get best of class components. So what does that mean? Today when you build a semiconductor, you build a monolithic. It means I'm going to use the same process, build everything on that way for everything in that chip. Which means if I want memory, if I optimize it for memory, which I probably can't optimize it for logic. If I optimize it for logic, I can't do analog, so I can't have you know good 
audio model. So what we do today is we, we start to compromise. We get pretty good memory with pretty good logic with pretty good analog. If you do build it on a chiplet, if you decompose it, where we're going to wire those together, you can always build it back to class. And it doesn't have to only be silicon. It can be other materials. In silicon, it's a great workhorse. It has a 50-year head start on all the rest of the types of materials. But those other materials do all perform. Gallium nitride is something we use a lot today for power converters, for RF, micro displays, many different things you can do. And this is part of the value proposition to bring more in to that, that total with fundamentally less material or that computer or your car or whatever it may be. So we can bring in heterogeneous integration, these different materials, and they can be photonics and MEMS, RF, and it gives you the advantage of it's a lower development cost because we're going to reuse these parts. I don't need to redesign that memory every time I'm going to implement it. I can just use memory chip over and over. The capital costs are lower. When we assemble these things together, we're building factories that are one to two orders of magnitude less cost, close to two. The development times are shorter because maybe we're just changing one chip. Or you could not design any new chips. You're really designing a circuit card. You're just doing it at micro scale. Lower risk, and we're dealing with tools which are a lot less expensive both software and the uh, manufacturing tools. So where is advanced packaging today? It's everywhere. We just haven't seen it. It's the overnight success that's been going on for 20 years. All of you have an advanced package 3D integrated circuit in your pocket because every cell phone camera is an advanced package 3D integrated was the first one to sell. They build 100,000 12-inch wafers every month for cell phone cameras. So the technology exists. And there's a huge laundry list of other components that are out there and being fabricated. So this has been a silent revolution already happening. And for the most part, it's been happening in very specific vertical niches by Intel's and AMD's and Marvell. We can point to them. They exist. We know who they are. Apple was the first one to use 3D sensors for the cameras. They've been doing it for several years. So how do we do this? What is advanced packaging? The workhorse for us is bonding technology. So we take these different materials and we can physically bond them together. So this here, so that's an eight layer stack that was done at wafer scale. Each one of those layers of silicon is about 15 microns thick. Today when we build a semiconductor, it's like building a building, except our foundation is about, oh, I don't know, 2,000 feet deep. Semiconductor, the real active part of the semiconductor is a very thin layer on top of this huge foundation. When we integrate things like this, what we do is we get rid of that foundation. And that allows us to bring those components closer together. So these little white lines there, those are vertical interconnects between layers. One micron by six microns. Human hair is emotionally 100 microns. Very, very tough. So this little stack here, as I recall, it has like 80 layers of metal in it. It has, uh, I know it was a logic device that we built there. I can't tell you what it was. Here is a device that we did with Teledyne. This is a uh, indium phosphide device. It's an RF device. It's actually implementing this with the CMOS device. These interconnects here, this is gold interconnect. These are the two pieces bonded together. The actual bond between those two interfaces 
is halfway through that kind of square block. The lighter is gold. These are copper wires. And that's at a 10 micron pitch. So we have 10 of those per human hand. And we can do much finer. For what it's worth, we have built things that are one tenth that space, smaller than that. So 100 times more dense. The wire, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, is the root of all evil. In semiconductors, wires don't scale well. We actually can't make the wires any smaller anymore. We make the transistors smaller, we have dirty little seed, but we haven't been making the wires smaller for a long time. So is that thermal? Um, those were done with EDI. So it's, it's hybrid bonding, it's a covalent oxide. And I'll actually show the bonding process. I'm going to explain the process right here. And so you're all going to get to see a film of how that bond works. So this is probably too technical for most of you in the audience, or at least beyond what you're interested in, but I put it in anyways. We get a wafer from an existing factory. So our factory, the one we're building here, is like any other semiconductor factory, except we don't build transistors. Everything we do is has to be with the metals and the dielectrics and the wiring that goes into it. And we have many, many different ways. I am dwelling for the most part on this because it's our workforce and bonding technology, but there are other facets of advanced packaging. So we get the wafers from the factory, and this could be Intel, it could be TSMC in Taiwan, it could be uh, Global Boundaries from New York, it can be any factory. And it can be different kinds of wafers. It can be that gallium nitride. In our factory, we use indium phosphide, gallium uh, nitride, silicon carbide, lithium iodate, uh, gallium antinamide, ingots, wide variety of materials. We use all of these different materials because they give you different performance. It allows you to do things that you can't do in silicon. So one of the key things to this technology is called CMP, chemical mechanical polishing. It's sanding. We sand that surface. And we can sand that surface within a molecule. It is super smooth. So we do that to about 0.4 nanometers of product. A nanometer is a billion of a meter. So that's uh, 100,000 of a human hair. If this were a football field, it'd be a piece of paper lying on the field. So that very fine smoothness allows us, when we bring two materials into contact, the atomic force of process can pull those materials together. We do a plasma treatment, which helps us to open up the oxide bond. We use glass. Silicon dioxide for this. And when we plasma treat it, we break those bonds a little bit. We have dangling hydrogen. Hydrogen is a one unit molecule. It is so small it passes through everything. So we can have it in this bond interface. We bring it together. It's so smooth, the atomic force between the two wafers pulls the wafers. And the hydrogen, because it doesn't like holding on to anything, this simply dissipates and it literally flows through the silicon material. It just passes out of the device. And that's the basis of what we do with all of this. And we can align those wafers typically below one micron. So 100th of a unit. That means we can have lots of those wires. Okay. So this film, and we'll see if I can get it to play right here, is, no, I don't know how to do it right here. So this is a highly calibrated engineer. He's gonna bond two wafers together. And what you're going to see here is putting a glass wafer down. And he's gonna to touch in the middle of the wafer and you'll see the wavefront propagate out. 
So the wafers actually are just sitting above each other, a little bit of an air buffer. But as soon as he puts his finger on it, in the center, you see that wave front propagate out? That wafer is now bonded. No, it's not actually permanently bonded. We actually have to heat it up to get rid of all of the hydrogen. But it reforms glass across that surface. In the pictures earlier, you really didn't see any bond line there. It's because we made the glass a uniform material. It's as if it was all done sequentially. And we can do that with lots of different underlying materials. It turns out we can do this with both glass and silicon nitrate, uh, nitride, which is another uh, dielectric material. We can also do it with many different sizes, about size and quick. And we can do it with individual chips on the tool. So other pictures showing the very fine pitches we can do, and we can obviously stack multiple layers. You saw that earlier. So you can barely see any line here. If it weren't for the misalignment, it'd be very hard to tell that those two are different to begin with. This is the future of electronics. It changes the world. And I have great news. In the United States, we're well ahead of the rest of the world. Enhance the stuff that no other entity, research or otherwise, can do in the world today. Now, we're not going to stay ahead forever, to be really clear. But at least today, I'd say we have at least a three year head start on the rest of the world. And enhance, we do this process every day. We do about 125 wafers a day, or two a month right now in North Carolina. Right now. The bag we're building here will do 5,000 wafers a month. In each of the two days, is about 10,000 total. The market for it is growing exponentially. Another element of the tanks package. I said, you know, man does not live by bonding alone. We have to build these silicon circuit boards. So what we're building, what used to be those green circuit boards that any electronics you take apart, we're doing exactly the same thing. But now we're doing it at micro scale. We're doing it on tiny pieces of glass and tiny pieces of silicon. So we can bring these components together. It's a silicon circuit process. And it gets rid of the wire. Much like the treaty integration we talked about, when we put parts next to each other, the industry coined this term two and a half feet. It's a terrible term, but we all use it. It really means putting things side by side in this very dense assembly. I say I talk more about this. The root of all evil is wire. The reason our computers don't go any faster, even though the transistors have gotten smaller, transistors go faster. Of the wire. Today, about 95% of the delay in a computer or your cell phone or any other piece of electronics is the wire. About 98% of the power is dissipated because of the wire. Transistors are infinitely fast and they use no power. But unfortunately, because the wires don't scale, we're stuck in a world that. Computers don't get much faster, even though the transistors get a lot faster. It's why Moore's law is failing. It's not really today that we can't make them any smaller. It's the benefit we get from making them smaller is so small. Okay. This is great. We can get rid of the wire. The wire gives us power back. It makes it run faster. But the other key component that advanced packaging and additive semiconductor manufacturing, I should explain additive semiconductor manufacturing, is I take that wafer from some other fab and I'm going to put some special material on it, or maybe a sensor, a lens device, a photonic interface, something that they couldn't do in that original process. But I can do that in this additive manufacturing. And I can do it at small scale, low volume, which enables 
new design. Well, that kind of neat new stuff I can do. I can put in things that are interfaces. I can have this very high density interconnect. I'll show you an example of that, that in a few slides that probably it would be mind boggling. Um, we can build antennas in. We actually have built a few devices where the antennas are integrated into the chip. So the whole thing is fabricated together. In reality, we have built everything that this shows here, except the battery. We've never integrated the battery. But everything else there, at some point or another, we have done. Preferably not all at once. So are the EVA tools Um, yes and no. The reality is EVA tools are not cheap enough. The, it's, uh, I have a slide later. The real challenge is the multi-physics aspect of what we're doing. The, the, you know, you never get anything for free. The hard part of this technology, any of these, is these different materials expand at different rates. You know, maybe you know, somebody can remember in high school physics, you have the ring and the ball, and you heat up the ring and the ball goes through, and what cools you. It's that expansion and contraction that really is a problem for much of what we do here. We're doing it at such fine scale, and these materials are so thin and so small that coefficient of thermal expansion difference is one of the most challenging things that we have to work on. And the EDA tools do a very poor job of modeling that for us. I think that's the frontier. The complexity of the different design kits, foundries are great. They give you this product development kit, PDK, a process development kit, depending on who you talk to. Um, it's a set of rules. And if you follow the rules, your part should work. As things have gotten smaller and more complex, the rules get more and more massive. When I started, the rule was like the rules were like a pamphlet. It was like four or five pages long. Today, the rules for a very lean process are two to three thousand pages. It's almost beyond human capability of doing the kind of transistor layout. I did all the time when I started in this 37 years ago. So the EDA tools really need to augment patients in the right way. Chiplets are the bread and butter of the future. It's building all of these unique little devices. This is NVIDIA's chiplet plan for, I'm not sure which one of their processors. This is, um, this, uh, I don't remember which Intel processor that is even. I can tell you the one up at the top. That's one that actually we built. Um, and that has each one of those sites. There's a big master chip underneath. And so it has five different chiplets that go on top of it. Those are done in a different set of processes and different materials. This is the latest AMD processor. And they have one chip underneath. And then they have a chiplet memory here, another chiplet memory here. And actually, these are two dummy chiplets that's moved each. One of the concerns about MPD is uh, we're bringing all of these components together. So we can't spread the heat out as much. We used to throw them out in order to get rid of the wire. Eventually, we're going to end up with this smoking very golf ball. Because you want it to be ideally a sphere wires as short as possible, and you'd have to have I.O. all over it. And of course, it would dissipate thousands of watts. Other things you can do. A lot of things being done with integrating MEMS. We have customers that are doing that today. We put those on top of these stacks. I can move the analog circuitry next to the sensor. I can add a processor to it and make me smart sensor. That is one of the big things that we can do moving forward. Internet of Things, based on the fact that you can do this, if you get rid of the wire, it uses less power, it's smaller, it's less expensive, 
it's easy to distribute. And like and you need things like triple A ten on board, you can distribute smart pass. On this other side, this technology is pioneered by Indiana integrated circuits. We work with them. So you can see this here. That's a dime. This is a real device. Now this is a prototype that's 3D assembled that has 46 tiles in it and it's connected on the edges. There's little fingers that connect just like these on the edges of those tiles. It's a flush mount sensor. It's an IR camera basically for aircraft. So you don't have to screw up the aerodynamics of your cell airplane or if you're high speed. So that device, I said it earlier, preferably not everything at once. This is where we're trying to do everything at once. It'll eventually be four layers. It's interposers. It's the side interconnect. It's four layers of 3D stack. It has different 3 five materials in it. Um, it's a very challenging device. But that total size there, this is smaller than a quarter. You can do microfluidics, and a lot of this is already being done. A lot of the, the testing that they do, the disposable tests, things like the, uh, um, uh, the glucometer, glucose testers for diabetics, they're integrated devices. A lot of the one, one off to a doctor's office, they have a drop of blood or a drop of urine or something, it typically goes some device like this, which runs the testing for one time use. But you have to bring together special chemistry, microfluidics, processing, analog display technology. And you want it to be in, you want it to be very expensive, but you want to throw it away. Advanced packaging drives that technology, drives diagnostics today. On the other side of this, I said, you know, the smoking hair is all that. You can do liquid cooling, and we do. We're working on a program right now that would produce a 7,000 watt chip. Your desktop computer with this guy in heat sink does maybe 200 watts gauge to standard desktop. It's about 100 watts of light bulb. In that same footprint, because 3D is driving it, we're going to do 7,000 watts. Well, that sounds like a very difficult problem, and it's non trivial, but we can cool it. We've already built things that cool at that kind of uh, component density. And you say, well, why don't you just spread it out? Because it adds wire. If I spread it out, it's not a 7,000 watt problem, it may be a 50,000 and then I can't pull that. So the advanced packaging brings an interesting set of solutions and problems with it that need to be solved. I tell a lot of our customers, you need to think differently about how you solve the problem. I'm not going to go into it in this talk, but one of the things that does come into this is figuring out the yield. You know, semiconductors are defective. Not every transistor is good. And you have to plan how you're doing with repairability and redundancy and trade off against how much does that add to the cost of the component. So there's a lot of strategic planning. And in fact, EDA Terra tools are terrible at that point. It's all done by hand. Another thing coming down the road. Photonics. And there's photonics in two different categories. One set of photonics is that fiber optic transceiver that people talk about and they connect with the networks, put things together. It's fantastic. That's been around for probably 20 years in most data centers. It's prevalent. Many of you may actually have fiber optic in your home and not even know it. A lot of the stuff that's on the ground today is. But there's another piece that most people don't know about. 
you can use light to do computation. So the new area that is growing is photonic AI, photonic computing. A lens does a matrix multiply. A matrix multiply is what AI does, with what AI requires. A lens can do something much faster at a fraction of the power of semiconductor circuits. So a, a photonic AI computer can run at least as fast as a silicon one, but at 1,000 power. This is becoming important because AI does wonderful things. Some of you may have heard about you know, chat GPT. And it's fantastic what it can do. But the data crunching required to do that is massive. It took months on a supercomputer to train that AI. If we continue on the current rate, data centers will consume more power than anything else in 20 years, 30 years. We have to have better ways to do it. A photonic AI computer is one solution to do it. The other thing is quantum. And Enhance is starting to build ion trap quantum qubits for a customer, actually two customers. If you look at compute, standard computer is really good for knowing one plus one equals two. AI works on fuzzy things. So AI is, I recognize you because I pattern match. And by the way, AI is not fundamentally smart unto itself. AI today is really pattern matching, and it does that really well. It does it much better than humans can do, but it doesn't think deeply. But it solves a class of problems that if I had to do it with a computer with one plus one equals two, it's really, really hard. It takes a lot of compute to do it in AI. The third branch of compute today would be quantum. And quantum is really interesting because it looks at all possible solutions at the same time. So it kind of does what that classic computer does, the one plus one equals two, but it can evaluate all possible solutions simultaneously. Problem is, it's really hard to do that. They run just a fraction of degree above the absolute zero. It's hard to build these qubits. And it turns out, in order to get the density you need, you need a million qubits to solve the easiest useful problem. And the one that's been put out there is nitrogen fixation. It's what happens in roots. We explain how fertilizer works. Solving how that works. In reality, people are very interested in it because they understand it. They can build, make better fertilizer to better understand. It will take a million cubes. The biggest machine today maybe is 4,000 cubes. So we have a ways to go. But advanced packaging is helping drive it because we'll be able to go probably two or three orders of magnitude larger in the next five years. So we can get to a million qubits relatively soon and start solving problems that are today unsolvable. To do that problem, by the way, a million qubits is going to take a million variable um, equations. So if you were doing it with a classic machine, you have to change each variable one at a time. You've got to go through a million of them. It's the definition of the lifetime of the universe. A quantum machine can do that instantaneously. You can try all million solutions at the same time. There's lots of things I'm glossing over. The world's not a perfect place. But in fact, we can solve problems that we can't solve any other way. We can't solve it with AI. We can't solve it with classic computers. The future, much like what I'm professing today with advanced packaging, for compute is going to be combining all of those. How do you make them work together? And I guarantee you advanced packaging is going to enable that.
I already brought this up. Things that you can do with sensors, different kinds of materials. This here is a, a gas sensor, and it requires some bizarre set of materials in order to make it work. The fact that we can integrate these all together in such tiny packages allows us to create intelligent edge sensors. One of the problems we have today in a lot of military systems, you can create a sensor has lots of pixels. It's like your cell phone. I mean, when you want to build a hundred million pixels. Well, you got to get that data back to the processor. Aircraft don't like having big bundles, you know, big bundles of cables running through the wing. It waits. Advanced packaging allows us to move the processing where the sensor is, and you transmit back only the data you need. Okay, co-design and multi-business. This is the, the crux of the engineering problem of how we put these together. And what is the difficulty? The tools today are pretty primitive. And we've spent 50 years evolving the tools, but pretty myopically focused on the traditional Moore's Law model. I'm gonna make the transistor smaller, I'm gonna scale everything, and I add some more rules. But as we start bringing these things together, we want to figure out how to do it. Now imagine the scenario I just laid, laid out with the, uh, the Intel 47 chiplet device. How do I decide what goes into a different chiplet? How do I partition? What is the best material? Should I do it in 3D? Should I do it in 2 this set of problem solving, the tools that help us as engineers today are very poorly equipped today. And so there's, an, there's another revolution, evolution happening in the software end of our industry, trying to figure out how to help engineers do this and do it more effectively. And at the end of the day, it comes out to cost. You know, you can, we can do marvelous things, but if you're going to pay for it, you want some return on your investment. So there's lots of sensitivities that we have to bring into account. This is the co-physics problem, the co-simulation, understanding multi-dimensional physics, the, uh, the CTE mismatch, that thermal expansion, the reliability of how they react to heat. Gallium nitrate is a wonderful material. You can run it at hundreds of degrees and it'll last forever. So it can not so much. There are other materials that get really shaky above maybe 100 degrees C. They don't even like that. Microprocessors love to run at 125 degrees C. There's lots of different trade offs. Matter of fact, they design public supplies where they run hot. They run more efficiently. If you ran a, if you ran a microprocessor like you run a power supply, it would burn up. So, what we do today, Enhance does these things. We have a factory today in North Carolina. Um, I like to say we build Lamborghinis, Ferraris, and Rolls Royces. We build very low volume, very unique parts for people. They go in military hardware, they go in satellites, and they go in your cell phones when you don't run the production. In fact, the first Apple cell phone down was built on that. So we do a lot of things for high quality commercial stuff, and that has been going to the Far East. I know we don't like to change that, and hence that's why we're putting a factory there. So I call it high-touch manufacturing is what we do today. So the factory that you see built here will get us to that next level. We're still not going to be a high volume facility, to be clear. We're going to build Cadillacs and Volvos. More affordable, but I'm not kidding you, they're not going to be uh, the scooter or the motorcycle. But we're planning for those. 
because there is a market. Remember I said, we have a three-year head start, at least. And the other guys have to actually invest and get into it too. So we have an opportunity today to leapfrog what they're doing in Asia. We may not have the same kind of opportunity again, promise, at least for another generation. So what we're building next door and enhanced is, is certainly the, the major tenant in it. We're putting it together. But we're providing common processes. I'm also trying to change some of the semiconductor business. Today, you go to a big factory, they build your chip for you, they deliver the chips. That's the relationship. But as we move to advanced packaging, one of the things that enables is building lower volumes of components. If you have to build a cell phone chip today and it costs you a half a billion dollars, okay, you're, you're going to be very conservative in it, you're only going to build one kind, there's not many choices. Advanced packaging allows us to build the same performance, but by using chiplets, it's now maybe half a million dollars. The power of that means that I can target the market. Now, I can't make the transistors smaller with advanced packaging, but I can do something else. Now, I'm going to use a terrible example because I haven't figured out a better one. Most of you buy a cell phone, and most of you use 10% of the capability. But I bet you last time you went, you didn't go in and say, I'm only going to use 10% of it, so it's all right if I don't give you 10% the price. I probably wouldn't have bought it. But advanced packaging, the additive manufacturing we're talking about, does is I can build a cell phone that's unique to your needs and unique to your needs and to your needs. And maybe I'm going to sell you 15% of the capability and you're going to use two thirds of that or 10%. But now I'm going to sell it to you for less. Just like what Moore's Law has done for the last few years, it gives you more for less. And the way I'm doing it is because I don't have to spend half a billion dollars to design it, I can do it for a million. I can build 50 different kinds of cell phones rather than one. I can make more money. I'm not going to do it for free. Our semiconductor business will get healthier. It's no longer a race to the bottom. You can build the cheapest part. It now becomes who can build the best value. It's a market which is no longer driven by the cost of capital. The reason all those factories went to Asia isn't because they were smarter. It's because their government subsidized the cost of capital. What we're going to do with advanced packaging, this boundary 2.0 approach, the value is now the intellectual property. Because the cost of capital, the cost of the design is small, which means you can now have startups. Today in the semiconductor business, if you have a startup, step number one, raise $100 million, you can get started. Every company that is a semiconductor company that has a startup today, they describe them as unicorns because they have to have ridiculous return on investment. They all project they're going to be multi-billion dollar companies in five years, so they can attract enough capital. This changes it. You can now have venture capital on startups. People can start companies. And because I can target all of these different markets, and I have an economic model that works, I have all of this leverage from reusing these chiplets and to be clear, the marketplace doesn't exist for these yet. It's coming. Right now it's vertically integrated. I said AMD and Intel and Marvell, there are people who do it, but it's their own devices. There's no general market, but there will be. And the reason there will be, it's the cost. And the cooperative model that we're doing next door, why we're doing this, is to allow people to bring their own special sauce. So the intellectual property you have, 
but you can't afford to exploit. You have to go to Intel today and say, please, won't you use my technology to give me something for it because it's a multi-billion dollar investment? We don't have a mechanism by which we can bring that into production. We can cross that valley of death that everyone talks about by enabling partnership. I call it a cooperative manufacturing partnership. The factory we're building will enable other people to run their processes and take advantage of the common things. Everybody uses the same lithography, the same you know, metals and the same etches. We will do that for them. And their special sauce, their thing that makes their unique technology worthwhile, they can practice in their own private space in that fashion. So we've broken ground on Westgate One, and uh, the clean room people have finally decided that they're done. So they're working on getting the rest of the architecture done. And any uh, any day now, we're supposed to have the final schedule and know when they're going to be building it out. That is a 200 millimeter and below cap. So that's older technology, but it turns out a lot of what we build, all of those funny other materials other than silicon, are small. They're small in diameter, um, weight, so therefore it fits well into that pack. But a year behind that, we're planning to have to have two, and that is 300 millimeters. So we'll be able to take leading edge state of the art wafers from Intel's, Global Boundaries, and Texas Instruments, and most companies, and integrate them. We have customers today. What we do is we take those wafers and we cut them down to eight inches and throw half the material away. If you're building Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces, that's fine. Unfortunately, that's not a good business model at least in the long term. In the longer term, we've cited two other high volume fat. Enhanced works with virtually every other semiconductor manufacturer in the world. Remember I said earlier, we don't build the grand business. I also don't think Intel's going out of business anytime soon. They're going to stay there. They're the people who build the material that I incorporate. I have to have a good relationship. One of the reasons I don't build transistors, as soon as I build transistors, I'm their competitor. Today I'm Switzerland, I'm neutral. I work with all of them. We incorporate their technology. And part of it is, if I'm going to do this, I need to know some details about how you're building your miracle. And if I'm competing with you, you don't want to tell me. So I need to do this in a fashion. I need to be Switzerland, and we are. But I do have people in that area who want to do not 5,000 wafers a month, they want to do more like 50,000 wafers a month. So we decided a couple other notional factories that are a little further to north here. We're living through a revolution in semiconductors that is just as big, as large as revolutionary as when the transistor went from the standalone device to an integrated circuit 15, 67 years ago. So as, as you move Absolutely. And that's why we are, are planning those plants. And I think there's a synergy of being able to go from low volume, as a matter of fact, this building here with nothing on it, that's planned to be a research app. And it will literally have a conveyor belt to tab one, so we can build the baseline processes for them and they can concentrate on the research. The intent is to give a seamless, go from technology development to low volume, High mix manufacturing. And for those of you who have no idea what that means, low volume, high mix. You're going to build a lot of different kinds of things, just not a lot of them. Today, low volume, high mix is synonymous with it's really expensive. Now we're trying to change that. We 
changing the flow of energy. And with scaliness, these factories will still be low volume, high net quantity industry scale. So we're going to provide a wide variety of baseline capabilities. Some of that additive manufacturing is we can do memories. And you can build today memory technology, which is better than the most advanced memory, but it takes some engineering. It's just appearing in the marketplace. We're going to do the 2.5 and 3D. We can embed passives and power devices. It's the best of everything. So we're building the vehicle that can both be a dump truck and a storage truck. So the road ahead. We live in interesting times. There's going to be a massive change in our industry. From an educational standpoint, we're going to need a lot of new talent. We're probably going to have a thousand workers at those factories in three years. In the industry, because it's driven by intellectual property, not by cost of capital, the value proposition in education has just gotten better. Advanced packaging swap. Size, weight, and color. We can make things smaller, they weigh less, they use less power. Your cell phone is small. It runs faster. It does more of what you want to do, not what the other guy wants to do. The future is very bright, and we're in a great position as a country to capitalize on. With what Congress has done, with what the state of Indiana has done to help us and help all of you ultimately, it's going to change the world. I think that we're going to have a new semiconductor mecca here in Indiana. Thank you for your time. Any other questions? Well, I, I think we can honestly say we're probably in the midst of a celebrity and potential celebrities in the audience here. What he's doing is going to be amazing. I, it's, I've been in the tech park for 12 years, and I, I, I'm so excited. I, it, it's so exciting. So I know everybody else is here, too. So, so thank you very much for doing that. So please stay with us for another five minutes, and then we'll go out. Um, the person that was, that was asking all the questions, he's actually going to be the one coming up here and speaking for five minutes. He's been very informed for five minutes. Um, but, but he has been involved in several projects. He's actually a Rose Holman graduate. He owns a company founder of Hacker G, which is out of Terre Haute. I'm not even going to begin to tell you what he does because it's everything. He's into DOE, DOD, any acronym you can imagine, NASA. He, he's done projects. So with all those experiences, he is actually in tune with all of the opportunities that are out there, whether they're grant opportunities, teaming opportunities, uh, maybe even Bob and Enhance could potentially take advantage of, of some of those. So, uh, Thomas, this is Thomas Faust, so come up, Thomas, and, and show us what you have. Thank you very much. And, and by the way, I am a real friend. So, yeah, I, 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 I made him long. Thank you uh, very much. So we just have two slides. I promise it'll be five minutes, so Scott's on um, oh, So while we're doing that, first, um, the main thing I want to talk about is a, a very fast turnaround uh, flash to bang opportunity with the Department of Energy, when we recently discovered there's a follow-on opportunity with the Navy, a Mantech that's manufacturing technology within mother level Navy, not the Mantech here in the park, but I'm sure they do work with Mantech Global. Um, the opportunity I'll talk about this very briefly first, just to prime the pump for future conversation, because I know that we have some drone people, autonomous uh, uh, system people in the room. Gary Bullock, who couldn't be here today, uh, with Pierce Aerospace, used to be with um, Crane and before that O&R. Uh, he has this idea of a um, drone, a UAS, 5G, he calls it the collaboratory. So that's a, a long word, but the idea, it, it's an important concept that it would be a collaboration space for universities, small businesses, 
uh, large crimes, so traditionals and non-traditionals, and we want it to be here in Indiana. So there is a space similar to this right outside of Washington, D.C. in Virginia, but it is uh, oversubscribed is the word that was used um, and mostly used by prime contractors where they like to show off stuff to um, our friends on Capitol Hill uh, to continue the, well, we, yeah, to get more funding. So, um, and to show what they're doing. So we would like this to be in the heartland here in Indiana. Um, we're evaluating a few spaces. We love to connect with people as we're pursuing uh, uh, this very large NSF grant. It's the first year of this grant. It's called the Mid-Scale Infrastructure Grant. NSF I identified that they are really good at funding stuff that's between $100 million and $900 million, and that would be like uh, radio telescopes. And they're really good at funding stuff that's less than $20 million, uh, but they're not good at funding stuff between $100 million and, or no, $20 million and $100 million. So they call that mid-scale infrastructure. So this is the first year, uh, the end of May, early June, they're gonna have a concept paper deadline. We will be submitting concept paper. We already have a team in place, but between that and December 5th, my birthday, is the submission of the full proposal. So knock on wood, we'll be accepted for the full proposal submission. I think we have a, a good team. Gary has been really leading this. He couldn't be here today. So I wanted to share that on his behalf. It really is his idea. He's been championing this, I think for almost eight years, trying to build a team, and I, I think he's done a wonderful job. I'm really passionate about it as well, and I want to support him in this concept. Uh, so just to throw that out there. So, all right, we're running the clock here. So now I want to talk about something else that um, I've been tangentially involved with. This was first led by um, some very forward-thinking people at Gross Holman, a group of uh, professors, uh, alumni, Tom James, who I don't think is here today, but uh, they, they used uh, uh, the, their team there, they were supported by the Lilly Endowment uh, to go out in Indiana and ask the question, why is Indiana, which is so wonderful, we're the number one state in the country for manufacturing intensity. So what does that mean? That means that if you look at Indiana as a state, we have the, uh, the largest portion of our population are employed in some way by their first degree or second degree to manufacturing opportunities that could be Industry 4.0 with design, all the way to people on the floor at the front lines with maintenance and with the you know three shifts of manufacturing. So Indiana should be and uh, should continue to hopefully be, um, if I have anything to say about it, uh, the, that workhorse in manufacturing. Uh, but we do a very poor job. We're actually at the other end of the list when it comes to helping hard tech companies who want to be manufacturers. So for some reason, there's this disconnect between our dominance and manufacturing intensity and helping the little guy get started. Uh, so I think that resonates with something that Bob, uh, Patty was saying a moment ago uh, with this idea of a collaborative time-shared space. So the, uh, Tom James's idea was to call this the Valley Hop. So let me dive in. We're actually a finalist for a Department of Energy $100 million grant. We've been working, uh, um, Paul Metcalf from Evansville has been a super connector connect us with people all over the country and actually in three continents uh, to build a team. And so we're really pushing towards that 50% match. We're very excited about it. We will be submitting the full proposal. We may not be successful in the first round, but we'll try again, we'll keep learning. So this is what Valley Hop means. So really quickly, within five minutes to explain, uh, if you, uh, when I started my company four years ago, uh, I'd read a lot of books, done a lot of case studies, I'd uh, done a lot of internships, and I thought that this would be my golden path uh, from TRL-1, the, the napkin sketch that I made in graduate school, to TRL-9, where I was shipping product. I thought, okay, I'm not going to tell you the number of years I thought it would take, but I, I, I said, okay, I, I know what that path is, and I thought it would be somewhat linear. But it, in reality, what I've learned in talking with uh, other fellow small business owners, in reality, you encounter a lot of steps where you might be on your way toward a valley of death, especially as you go from uh, initial idea to prototype. There are a lot of things that can go wrong. You have to make pivots. But especially once you have your Frankenstein prototype, there are a lot of programs, and I've been very lucky and fortunate to work with people who have helped me get into these programs to, at DOE and NSF to, to get money to make those prototypes and work with customers. But then you need to make low volume manufacturing. And to, uh, when you go interact with manufacturers, they want you to make 10,000 of something. Because if you're injection molding, uh, sorry, if you're injection molding, uh, the cost of tooling, things like that, it's very high up front. So the unit, unit economics are not in your favor. So to be very fast here, our goal is to find a way to bridge this valley of death, get us back on that high rate of hopefully 
the exponential or greater than exponential growth so that the company can survive and create jobs. And so to do that, we need to be like the Kool-Aid man and bridge, uh, go through that wall, that valley of death, and have this, uh, what we call the valley hop facility. So it is a, in the same zip code, maybe not the same building, you need to have uh, tenant anchor manufacturing companies. So right now we've identified 15 uh, uh, large manufacturing companies that are very, very interested uh, to pursue this concept with us and go down this journey. We'd love to have more. And the idea is that if they're in the same zip code and they're part of this Valley Hop group, they're providing uh, long-term lease payments to cash flow, what is on the other side of the building, which is the Valley Hop collaborative space that Bob Patty was talking about. So these uh, anchor companies are the whales, and then you have these barnacles of the ecosystem around it where you have this timeshare equipment. So we can talk more about this out there. I could talk for many hours, um, and that's why we have the networking space. But we really are, at the end, the ask, what we're asking for is we're sprinting towards a June 8th deadline, and there are two big things we need. Uh, talking very fast, uh, there, there's this thing called a Justice 40 paperwork, so I can talk more about that out there, where we're trying to figure out people around the state to help us understand how to complete that paperwork, which even if, uh, well, when we're successful, we will submit something. That paperwork is important for anyone in here who wants to submit for the CHIPS grant. You will have to complete this Justice 40 paperwork. So I'm happy to be the, uh, um, the guinea pig. I'm happy to be the pioneer to help force this activity because Indiana will need to have examples. We need to have templates because uh, if you don't submit that, uh, you are automatically disqualified from consideration. You must have that paperwork done correctly. And we're also looking for more partners. So I ran over. Thank you. Um, but I look forward to talking to you outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. You, you've met the second or first most ambitious person in the world alongside Bob Patty. Both of them work 24 hours a day, I think. But I, this is a little bit over a normal first Tuesday event, so we appreciate you seeing it. Good crowd, good people. Um, he is actually going to have a whiteboard monitor out there. If anybody's interested in learning more about this, he can, he can talk about this to no end. And it is very interesting. He's got a lot of opportunities. So, and Bob's going to stick with us too. So please go out, enjoy some food. Uh, thank you to NSTXL, that is our sponsor for the for the food and beverages, which is Switchyard Brewery out of Bloomington. So great, great little food items and, and some beverages. Grab some of that. I um, just want to mention too that that if you haven't been here before, this is what we do on the first Tuesday of every month. We are going down the semiconductor microchip lane, and so next month, June 6th, I believe it is, we're having reliable microsystems. They will be here. I know Julia Buckley's back there. She's she's the VP, I think. Are you VP? Chief, sorry, Chief Operating Officer, my fault. Um, but the CEO will be speaking during that one. Uh, in August, we also have the Trusted, Solu trusted System, Trusted okay. Semiconductor Solutions, sorry about that, TSS. They will be here. And then along the lines of, of Bob talking about the chat GTP, GPT, whatever it might be, GPT, um, we actually have been in contact with a, a research associate from George Mason University that has done an article on chat GPT and the defense industry. So we're going to be doing a webinar here, well not here, but a webinar June 14th. So make sure you go on the westgate-academy.com website, find out all the other events. You can see the past ones we've done, the presents. Thank you all for coming. Please go out and talk amongst everybody, find out more about everybody, and thank you all for coming.